Good morning, yes, I, I want to hear that applause. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session. Hopefully, you're not too tired from yesterday's party. Um, did you know that there's more than a hundred legitimate philosophers, thinkers, and scientists that said that we wouldn't make it to 2020. So first of all, I want to congratulate everyone. We made it, we made it, and we should be proud of that. Um, so it, predictions fail. We've heard apocalyptic predictions, we've heard predictions in our companies that usually fail. If I want to take you to a journey, and if you take a step back and you think about 2010, what did you think would happen in 2020? Close your eyes, think about it. I'm sure that the answers would be very different. <laughs> what did you guys think 2020 would bring us? So, me personally, I thought we would be shaking hands with robots. I thought um, probably we wouldn't be uh, carrying smartphones in our pockets. We would have them implanted in our, in our heads. The reality is that, again, forecast predictions failed. The one thing that I'm sure no one thought about when thinking about 2020 is that we would still have shitty ads and shitty advertising experience. That was on, on, on no one's prediction. Unfortunately, from Charvus, we cannot change the robot situation. We cannot change the we cannot change the smartphone. Really, we're not making implants in our brains. But I hope we can change the world with a different approach to advertising and monetization in app. And this is what the session today is about. It's 2020, we made it, but now it's time to freaking change the way ad monetization is made. So what I'm gonna share today is, I don't wanna make this boring, it's just six thoughts, six concepts that every game developer, every monetization manager should know today and moving forward. A little bit about, about myself, this is me if I was part of a shooting game. I'm not, unfortunately. But in case you're wondering about my accent, I'm originally from Barcelona, but I've been living in San Francisco for more than 11 years. Um, I'm father of three. I love traveling, speaking new languages. If you share that, come to me afterwards. Uh, I'd love to exchange some, some thoughts about travels. And I've been working around the App Store since pretty much the beginning, since 2009. I've been part of Charboost uh, since 2011, and I'm chief strategy officer. For those who don't know Charboost, we're an in-app programmatic platform, very focused in gaming because this is a, a really at our core. So we help game developers monetize their inventory, make money with their traffic, at the same time that we help advertisers reach engaging audiences. We're lucky enough to work with some of the top brands in our space. We're privileged to work and partner with them. And we sit in a position of privilege where we see a lot of the trends that are happening in the industry. So from these trends, from this intelligence, from our partners, uh, again, I'd like to remind you of the six things that every monetization manager should know in 2020. Let's get started. First of all, it's important to know where we come from. It's important to know our history in order to know the present and in order to know what's gonna happen in the future. A little bit of history for those who haven't been uh, in the industry for that long. The App Store was launched in 2008. The world was very simple back then, or a little bit simpler than today. There were few ad networks, few competitors in your genre. It was probably easier to get eyeballs. And usually what game developers would do is just partner with a single SDK ad network. They would partner with them, they would try to maximize the, the revenues from that ad network. Obviously, as the audiences grew, as gaming became more complex, we needed more than one ad network. And this is really when simple mediation came to fruition. Mediation is just a layer that allows you to distribute traffic across different ad networks, SDK ad networks. Still, it was pretty simple. The ad networks didn't have any risk. It was all eCPM, predicted eCPM. But you as a publisher, if you were working with performance ad network, you were paid on CPI uh, only when the install actually happened. As Mediation became even more complex. In 2017, roughly, we started talking about um, multiple line items. You didn't only want to work uh, with different ad networks, but also you wanted to set floors. You wanted to know, okay, who can deliver an ad over $20? And if no one responded, then you jump to the next floor, 15, and, and you go down. 
that is obviously still not optimized. There's a lot of work there. And what we're seeing, especially after 2019, we were talking about this earlier, is the growth of bidding and unified auctions. With the growth of uh, and the development of programmatic, we're seeing new ways in which monetization is happening, it's CPM, there's commitment from the bidders, and it's essentially based on auctions. And this is really what we're gonna be talking about. So every year we run a survey across multiple game developers, over hundreds of game developers. If you guys wanna still participate, it's still open. And we ask them about the, the most recent trends and what are they seeing, what are they worried about. What we saw in the last survey that it's still running compared to 2018 is that obviously the last bucket, single ad networks, less and less game developers, and probably only on the, at the long tail, are, only, are, are partnering with only one ad network. That's pretty obvious. And the growth is really coming on third-party traditional waterfalls, so third-party mediations that manage this waterfall, and the concept of a hy hybrid mediation, which is a waterfall plus a programmatic component. So what we're seeing is that the industry is shifting towards that. It's becoming, it's relying on third party players. It's still not 100% there. And definitely the bucket of in-house exchange, so companies that have built their own exchange internally or are using bidding, a, a, a unified auction concept, is still not, not as big as a, as a purest solution. <laughs> You see that the waterfall is still there, whether it's uh, with a third party or, or with your own in-house mediation. We know today that the waterfall model is broken. The waterfall, essentially, what, what it does is it looks at historical data and it tries to predict the value of each ad network, right? Very simple. You work with four ad networks in this example. You look at uh, the performance in the past and you try to predict how, how uh, will it perform uh, for this particular impression. What happens is that the number one network that performed well in the past doesn't mean that for that particular impression is the best performing. You can have network number three that didn't have the chance because in the past didn't perform that well, but now it could give you a $10 CPM compared to a $6.5 CPM. That's, that's really what happens on a water, waterfall setup, on a traditional waterfall setup. So there's missed revenue um, because of the predictive predictions are fail, as I said at the beginning. Um, also, not every demand partner that you work with has the opportunity to bid. And if you don't give them the opportunity, you're not giving them the chance to actually give you the best uh, bid that they can. Managing all that has some overhead cost. You need to uh, optimize it, you need to change things. Um, it can be cumbersome, and there's no transparency. In most cases, you don't know why did that network uh, uh, got called the first, or why, why uh, that network at the bottom didn't have a chance to, to perform. So in short, the waterfall model is broken. And RTB is the way to go. RTB is not, is not new as a concept. Real-time bidding is not a new concept. When you think about the waterfall, the traditional way, it's almost like going to a market. It's very inefficient, sometimes it's subjective. You may be selling products that are high quality to someone for low, just because mm, you like that person. Or the other way around, you sell a premium for a shitty product because it's just a tourist, <laughs> right? And that's what happens in a marketplace. And this is what happens also in real life uh, on a waterfall. Sometimes you're giving your best traffic to people that actually don't deserve that and are not performing very well. On top of that, it allows a lot of deals, negotiations, bargains that are not very efficient, to be honest. The concept of an auction, again, and real-time bidding is not new. It's just giving a bunch of buyers the opportunity to bid in real time. And you just pick the highest bidder, as simple as that. So when you bring that into advertising, that's what we're doing with RTB. You have an SDK that sends an ad request to an auction server, and you just call all the demand partners you want. You can have ad networks, you can have DSPs, you can have brands, you can have performance advertisers, whoever you can think. And you let them bid in real time for that particular particular impression. There's no predictive, there's no historical, it's just for that impression. How much do you value that impression and how much are you willing to pay for that? And you get the bid, re the bid responses and you pick the, the, the highest. As simple as that. Again, not new, but we're slowly implementing that in the world of in-apps. 
I'm not sure how familiar the, the audience is with auctions. There's essentially two pricing uh, dynamics. There's first price auction, which means that the bidder, the highest bidder, wins, and that price that they bid is the commitment. That, that's what they pay. In a second price auction, which is what traditionally exchanges have been uh, using, um, what happens is that the highest bidder wins the auction, but th they pay the second price with just a little cent more. So it's just a little bit more than the second price. Obviously, the dynamics of bidding are different. As I said, ad exchanges traditionally, especially because Google embraced second price bidding at the beginning, work with second price. But uh, in a unified auction world, first price is the trend that we're embracing. So we want that commitment from, from all the bidders. Again, the waterfall is broken, and RTV is the way to go. Number four. In-app bidding is changing the way monetization in-app is, 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 is happening. In-app bidding is uh, taking the example of header bidding on the web. Essentially, uh, there was a movement against Google's monopoly on cherry picking the inventory of the web. They had the opportunity to bid on almost every everyone on top of, uh, of all the different ad players. So essentially, it takes the dynamics of RTB, and again, it runs an auction in parallel. You call everyone server side. If there's an SDK, you also allow an SDK rendering. But you aggregate as much demand as possible. You send bid requests in parallel. And, and you, ac you accept those bids to run that auction. And again, first price auction is usually what it's being run. And um, demand partners, again, can be, when you see demand partners, it can be exchanges. It can be. SDK networks that you've been working uh, with in the past. It could be potentially DSPs. It could be, it could be pretty much anything that has the ability to bid in real time programmatically using OpenRTB. Within a bidding, what happens is that again that dynamic of um, traditionally the best performing gets the impression that doesn't happen. It's really whoever values that impression the most that is going to get the opportunity. So. It increased revenue. You've probably heard many solutions out there sharing the initial case studies. We're seeing at least 10% uplift in our DAO, in average revenue per, per daily active user in, in the majority of them. Again, the, the bids are committed CPM, so there's no tricky trickiness. Whatever they bid is what you get. And uh, you save ADOPS resources. Once all these demand sources are connected programmatically, you don't need to actually set up uh, weird things have deals, it's very transparent. It's, it's about a game of bidding the, highest you can, uh, the, the, the higher you can in order to win that impression if you really value it. And um, transparency and control is important. That unfortunately doesn't happen um, always, but if you're working with a solution, uh, an in-app bidding solution that doesn't offer uh, transparency, that's not because it's not possible to offer transparency, it's because they don't want to offer transparency. So um, in 2020, again, there's no reason for any developer to not knowing what's happening with their inventory. And in fact, if you're running real-time auctions, you know exactly how much worth is every bucket of your inventory. You can price. You know each each segment of your audience, how much are people willing to buy, to, to buy them for, for? So it gives you a good, uh, a good, a good insight in order for you to calculate your LTV com uh, together with, with the in-app purchases. But in, in the in-app ad revenue uh, world, at least with in-app bidding, you're getting full transparency into the value of each one of your, of your users or each segment of your users. It sounds ideal, I know. <laughs> Hopefully I've convinced you about the power of in-app bidding. What's happening? Why is in-app bidding not being that quickly uh, adopted? Well, there's two, two main forces. The first one lies on the developer side. You guys, uh, game developers, and the other, uh, and the other lies on the on the industry itself. And I'm going to talk about these two differences. As part of the survey, we asked these over 100 companies why, uh, if they've already tested in a bidding or or a, a similar solution. Around 35% have already tried it. 
and then you see over 35% also that will try it in the next year, including next six months and 12 months. There's still a, a bucket that is reluctant, that doesn't plan to, to, to test it. So it's slowly getting, getting uh, introduced in the mind of game developers. We also ask the reasons why they haven't tested if they haven't. And you see that there's still a lack of understanding of the technology. So that's why we're here, and if you have questions, please let us know. Uh, we're committed to this, this transformation of the way a monetization happens. The other thing is lack of resources to implement it. If there's anything we can do to help there, also let us know. Um, there is still, again, a bucket that is reluctant with this, um, with this uh, way of, of managing inventory, and they like the setup, the waterfall setup, or the deal making that they're having. They believe that, um, that um, it's working fine. So <clears throat> in an ideal world, a unified auction is all it happens. But the reality, uh, so you, you just run a unified auction, you have all the demand partners uh, bidding into that auction. The reality is that what we're seeing is that not all the demand partners are ready or willing to bid this way programmatically. They lose a little bit of control. And again, transparency is not always good for everyone. So what's happening and what we're seeing and we're going to probably see for the next uh, uh, year is that concept of a hybrid model where the unified auction happens at the top, but then the result of that auction needs to get compared with the traditional waterfall, with these floors, with these predictive ACPMs. So we know that unfortunately, because not everyone is ready to bid this way, we're, we need to be ready to embrace this hybrid model that um, makes both the waterfall and the unified auction coexist. And my last thought is always about the users. And uh, so the last, last point is that every player is different. And this is an obvious statement, but unfortunately when we do ad monetization, we don't think about it. And it's important. And when unified auctions are properly implemented, you get a different ad experience also for different types of, of players. If you think about it, um, no matter who you are, when there's an impression opportunity, there's an auction. You have a bunch of different buyers that value yourself as a user, as a player, very differently. You may be, you may be a, a male, you may be a female, you may be living here, there, you may be a traveler, you may be whatever you are, you have a different value for different buyers. And this is why in real life, what you see is that if you're probably a male in your uh, 40 uh, years old crisis, you're gonna get a, a sports car. And if you're a female running in, uh, in the streets of New York, you're gonna get a fashionable brand or whatever it is because these brands value you as a user very differently. And that is good because that tailors and customizes the gameplay and the, user, the player experience that you're offering. So that's it to wrap up. Programmatic uh, monetization stacks are more efficient. Um, developers uh, can save ad ops resources. They don't need to manage that much of their, of their tech stack with that. And if there's one message, there is no reason in 2020 and beyond for developers to not have transparency, control, and user experience. Thank you so much. Great, Pepe. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Pepe? Yes. Do, do we have time? How, um, yeah. We have like quite time for two questions. Perfect. Hi. <coughs> Sorry. Hi. I'm um, just wondering, what's the difference then between, uh, say, what you do and, say, someone like App Lovin, who also do in app bidding? Yes. That, this is a, a great question. Um, <coughs> It, it really, so, so where, where we're coming from is really an ad network evolving into, into a unified auction. Right now what we are offering is transparency only on the unified auction. What AppLobbing has is uh, mediation together with a, with a unified uh, auction altogether, right? Our take, uh, while we may be seen very, uh, very similarly, our take is always on the transparency on, and the control. So uh, we, we've put a lot of effort on, on giving you the, the, the um, analytics analytics, the, the resources for you to pull the data and see what's happening in every single auction. Thank you. I lied. We had time for one question. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank um, you so much. Where can we find you if we want to ask you questions later? Absolutely. I'll be around. We also have a, a room at the lobby of the, of the hotel, so across the courtyard. It's called Worsley Room, and we'll be there all day. Fantastic, Pepe. Thank you very much. Thank you.